maybe you can tell us how accountability can potentially work together with the direct participation of citizens. For example, there are a few examples like crowdfunding in mm -hmm. finance, mm -hmm. which opens new opportunities. But when we talk about political decision, mm -hmm. how that would work? Well, right now, because of the lag between the situation and the culture's adoption of the situation, the democratic mandate is operating in a world that hasn't existed for 20 years. Right? Yes. And we need to make decisions which are grounded in the present. So the lag between where culture is and where technology is, the lag between where culture is and where policy is, the lag between where culture is and where pol and, uh, the political situation is, is enormous and it's only growing wider. So, for example, um, when was the last time you heard anybody seriously discussing biological weapons? Actually, just recently, I, I, I've seen an article um, online, uh, mm -hmm. and it was at the um, level of, I believe, um, some minister asking questions about that. Mm -hmm. So I believe that there is something, but I'm not sure to what extent it goes deeper in terms of understanding yeah. what the problem is, rather yeah. than just talking about the problem. So, I mean, the last time I saw big activity around biological weapons was just after 9-11, when people were emailing uh, anthrax through the, or emailing, sorry, were mailing anthrax to each other through the US postal system. Right? And then a few years later, they found some biological weapons lab in Iraq, and it was dressed up as being, oh, look, the war was the right thing. And then somebody looked at it again and said, no, that's a decontamination vehicle. And that was really the last time that I saw people focusing on it in public. But I'm completely convinced, from everything I know about the science, from everything I know about the history, that biological weapons are a huge part of the forces which shape military strategy and even the whole war on terror, so-called. Yeah. Right. I think an enormous amount of that is about biological weapons risk, and I'm guessing that that's the case, right? Because all that stuff is off is off radar. Yes. So if we were to try and get the general public briefed on biological weapons risk and biological weapons strategy to the point where they were informed enough to make a decision, by the time we were done, we'd probably have a third of our population so depressed they'd be unable to function in their jobs. When you talk about biological weapons. It has very little effects on the society well, as such. We think it has little effect on the society, right? But on the morning when we discover we're wrong, two billion people will die, right? If the if the entire hierarchy of the military industrial complex is actually a machine for handling biological weapons risk, which I think is very possible, then you could discover that the whole society has been shaped by invisible men fighting an invisible war against an invisible opponent since the end of the Cold War. Maybe even from before the end of the Cold War. And it, you know, we, I say biological weapons, it could be space-based nuclear weapons. Sure. It could be little green men that we found on the moon. It could be just about anything. But the point is only that getting an informed consent from the public requires educating them in things which are psychologically damaging for them to know about. And in this kind of position, the biggie is global warming, right? Yes. The public's understanding of global warming is so far behind the climate scientists' understanding, it's a 20-year gap. The climate scientists are beginning to wonder whether they should shoot their children before things get really bad, and the general public is only just getting aware that maybe they should change their light bulbs, right? And the closer you get to the frontier of climate science, the more the unbelievable terror is a daily fact of life for the scientists who are looking at the data. This 20 cents Celsius temperature anomaly in the Arctic, never seen that, right? 20 Celsius temperature anomaly. If that had happened in New York, they would have all frozen to death, or they would have had, like, you know, spring rain in the middle of uh, January. You know, 20 Celsius is an yes. astonishing anomaly. So I think that what I'm saying is that it's impossible to educate the public. If we talk about fourth industrial revolution or digital revolution, would you say that the biggest role in fourth industrial revolution would be played by programmers and people, for example, who are very close to the tech side of the society? Yes. So in a position where the public cannot be educated because it simply takes too long and they don't want to know, we wind up having to put the representative in representative democracy in a really serious role. Right? So right now, in the US and in the UK, most of the people who are the representatives are lawyers. Yeah. Because their job is to make law, the idea is you get people who are really understand law to make law. The problem is that they're incompetent in science and technology, and the main drivers of the story at this point are science and technology. Right? US unemployment turns out, according to recent studies, to be largely produced by industrial robots, rather than to have been produced by uh, outshoring of work. 
you know, the, the fundamental drivers of unemployment are technological, and we're going to see that hit the middle classes, we're going to see the self-driving cars, and the idea that people that have never written code for a living are going to be making the decisions about how we regulate these technologies seems kind of out of step. Like, we really want a very different class of solutions here. Uh, and to get that, we have to try and get way more science and technology people into government and into the institutions to make these decisions, because they're the only people that have any chance of getting these decisions right. I don't think it's reasonable to accept lawyers as the you know, de facto engines of government in a situation where science and technology are increasingly the driving point of government. I just read the World Economic Forum report mm -hmm. um, on security, mm. and um, they all talk about interest of business and partnership with government, mm -hmm. multi-stakeholder, responsibility, accountability. Yeah. Uh, how does it fit with what you just said? Well, so whenever I hear multi-stakeholder, what I hear is goat rodeo, right? They will all want different things. They will have no ability to coerce each other. So they can't form a cartel. They can't cooperate. They can't compete. All they can do is talk. A uh, single stakeholder with accountability, I think, actually solves problems. Multi-stakeholder, I think, simply pro prolongs them. Um, how we build accountability mechanisms where people nail their colours to a mast on a course of action, and then when the course of action succeeds, we reward them, and when it fails, we take them out of the loop for the next decision. I don't know how we get that. I mean, this is almost like a I, I totally agree with you, but I have just one problem with it. What about the... Well, in China, in German, so world overview, it's mm -hmm. very individual. And people mm -hmm. who program and people who do science or people who do politics, mm -hmm. they have different worldviews. And mm -hmm. if we just take one of those, I, I'm not saying which one, mm -hmm. and trying to implement this one and program it into the code, don't you believe that we can potentially create some problems for other parts of society? So we already have that situation. The specialist group which runs society are called lawyers. Almost all uh, MPs uh, or uh, lawmakers in America have a legal background. Almost none come from science and technology. Yeah. So in a situation where the problems are scientific problems, where the problems are technological problems, having the people that really know how to manage those kinds of situations being in charge of them is perfectly logical. Yes, it will produce a change in who is disproportionately represented, but we already live with that problem. The problem of having one class of people be completely dominant in society, it's lawyers and the rich that make law. Uh, Lawrence Lessig talks about rule by Lester. That in America, because you need to raise big money donations to be able to run a campaign, uh, it turns out the big money donors are the people that decide who is or is not going to be able to run. As a result, without campaign finance reform, only people that are acceptable to the ultra-rich can be American politicians. That's a fact of life. America has to live with that. The idea that you simply displace the legal elite with the scientific and technical elite, you know, this might be a mess, it might not be any more democratic than what we have, but we, it will not be any less democratic. And of course, we do want a system which is more democratic, but to get there we're going to have to overhaul the machinery of democracy, because we are as democratic as we can get within four-year electoral democracy. And until we do the technological overhaul of the way that we figure out what the will of the people is, we are going to be stuck with um, unrepre unrepresentative elites. So, as we can see, our current um, social system is quite constrained. There are many mm -hmm. limitations, mm -hmm. and some of them may be, uh, can be overcome by using new technologies, new innovations. Mm -hmm. Blockchain, AI. Mm -hmm. um, might be some of those technologies. Oh, yeah. So do you believe that those technologies will actually empower or disempower an individual in the future? Um, I think that we will discover that some individuals who are good with these technologies will be enormously empowered, but the vast majority of individuals in Europe and America are losing power very rapidly because their economies are no longer dominant. In 1970, America did something like 50% of the world's manufacturing. 50% of the world's manufacturing inside of America with 5% of the population. They were incredibly rich relative to the rest of the world because they were incredibly productive. And in the areas where they wanted raw materials and couldn't afford them, they'd have an invasion. Yeah. The whole Banana Republic period. So the Americans have been losing momentum since the 1970s because they came out of World War II as the world's only superpower. 
they had the massive advantage in the nuclear age, they had huge economic productivity, and they basically ate the world. Yes. Right? But that was 50 years ago now. And over those 50 years, they've lost momentum, lost momentum, lost momentum. Europe, uh, okay, it was shattered after World War II, but it was also America's primary trading partner. They were enormously protected by the Americans. The Americans pumped enormous amounts of resources into standing Europe up as a buffer against the USSR. And that golden era was the peak of an empire. The global average standard of living is around Mexico. And what's happening is that the rich European and American world is gradually sliding towards Mexico at the same time as India and Africa and the poorer parts of South America are all sliding up towards Mexico. Everybody is converging towards the middle and the ultra elites uh, have basically globalized their effort to maintain above that level uh, in a way which is quite sinister but also not new. So uh, maybe we don't know where we're going, but we can see that technology will definitely shape and change the dynamics mm. and relationship between the governments and uh, population. The, the critical factor in all of this is rate of change. Right? So the ability for an entity to react appropriately to its environment uh, varies depending on how quickly the environment is changing. So an incredibly intelligent, technical elite individual can look at the technology, can make informed decisions, and can generally get that part of the strategy right. But they're more or less the only person that can. If you go then to a group of 15 such individuals, now you have groupthink, you have delays, you have latency, everything slows down, things become much more difficult. If you go to an organization the size of, say, IBM or Microsoft, the lag is now five years. Might be 10 years. So if you try and look at any given organization mm. and figure out how large the lag is, it gives you some idea of how good or bad the decision making will be relative to rapid rates of change. And the one thing that I'm almost certain of is that the rate of change accelerates and continues to accelerate, certainly for the next 10 to 20 years, probably for the rest of my life. So do you believe that we should put any constraints on the liberty of individual to make changes to a new system? let's say programmer programming something, or shall he or she be free to make whatever choices that they want to make? Well, I mean, from my perspective, um, there are two tiers of this question. So one of them is about individual freedom, the other is about social choice. So from my perspective, uh, you know, f uh, programs are speech. Right? If you believe in free speech, somebody should be able to sit down in front of a computer and instruct it to do anything. On the other hand, at a social choice theory level, the structure of the technology you build increasingly affects the society that you get. So is Facebook a media company, or is it a website that some kid knocked up on a weekend in Harvard? You see? Not Harvard, wherever it was. Yale. Um, one of those places. Where did Facebook start? Harvard. It was Harvard. It was Harvard. Okay. So inside of that situation, the question then is who watches the watchman? Right? If you attempt to have some mechanism by which we regulate the creation of technology, who then does the regulating? Yeah. If the answer is people that are 20 years behind the curve, we might slit our own throats on the ability to manage climate. Because certainly the current techno-social structure has no possibility of managing the climate crisis. At all. Nothing. No hope. No structure that is currently standing is able to cope. So if we slow technological progress, we may slow technological progress to the point where we don't develop the tooling necessary to make the turn, and we wind up with two billion people dying in a famine, right? Or we continue to accelerate as fast as we can. We accept that there are going to be a bunch of downsides, and we, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, will that there is an island of stability that we can reach in time to build the necessary mechanisms. So you could do a global representative democracy pretty easily. I've done a couple of talks about it. But yeah. the simple approach is that you basically use opinion polling and global randomized uh, calls to be able to build statistical models of what global public opinion is. And you can do this at very manageable cost. Right? We call 20,000 people if it is a provably random 20,000 and we appropriately compensate the model for, for example, areas where phones are more scarce, yes. then you could build a decent statistical tool that would allow you to survey human, uh, the global opinion for a few tens of thousands of dollars per question. It could be incredibly cheap. And 
that kind of an approach to building a global democracy might give us representation at very affordable costs without necessarily building a mechanism to implement them. Similarly, you could build a carbon-based global reserve currency pretty easily. You take the remaining carbon emission that we can do, you divide it up equally among the human race, you issue it to them on a blockchain, and then you allow people to trade. Right? And all of the big carbon emitters are basically going to have to register these tokens or they're going to pay enormous taxes. Yes. Those kind of approaches, you could just about make something like that work. Right? But to get into a position where you'd actually implement those things requires so much change. It requires so much acceptance of the climate reality from the mainstream populace. I don't know whether we make it in time. So as we can see, we're heading towards the fourth industrial revolution, or digital revolution, as you said? Some of us. Maybe right? last remember, digital revolution? But remember, three billion of us still uh, work on farms, and 80 or 90 percent of our calories are food that we grow with our own hands. So is it a gap or a lag that they're experiencing? Well, if it's a lag, it's a lag of maybe five centuries. Right? Now, on the other hand, they're also getting mobile phones. You know, Kenya, for example, has enormous penetration of mobile phones, even into the one acre farmer agriculture class. Yes. So the thing about all of this stuff is it's very, very, very unequally distributed, and not for reasons that are entirely about money. Yes, buying state of the art technology is expensive, but it's a lot less expensive than buying a state of the art car. It's a tenth or a hundredth of the cost of buying a state-of-the-art house. Do you believe in equal distribution? Um, do I believe it's a good idea or do I believe it's possible? Well, um, first, if it's a good idea, and secondly, do you believe that new technologies can help us to have it uh, implemented? Well, so a global average standard of living is somewhere around Mexico. If we take all the world's resources and divide them uh, equally, we wind up with an individual budget of something like $5,000 a year. Yep. Right? If everybody in the world is living on exactly $5,000 a year, I think that what's going to happen is that we're all going to die. Because you no longer have the ability to do deep scientific research because you cannot pool the resources efficiently into mechanisms that allow you to punch through. What happens is instead of having a blast furnace at the center of the civilization where we just throw money and what comes out of it is miracles, yes. you distribute the heat so evenly that the alchemical furnace goes out, progress stops, and then we wind up back in the Stone Age in about 200 years. Right. So I think that equality at the point of a sword where we impose this kind of equality in a top-down fashion is basically suicide. On the other hand, Kerala in India has a life expectancy within two years of European norms. They've got a fertility that's, I think, at or below your replacement. They've got a 95% literacy rate, and they've got an average income of a dollar a day. So they have roughly equality on health outcomes and roughly equality on educational outcomes on, I don't know, 1% of the income of Americans. Right? And that model of equality, where rather than modeling equality in cash, we model equality in lifespan and infant mortality. Yes. That kind of equality, I think, is completely possible. Because 90% of the gains come from clean water, sanitation, adequate diet, and a few other things like that. You know, maternal education, maternal health monitoring, female education. All of these things, birth control, all of these things are incredibly cheap, both environmentally and economically. Yes. So I think that we could bring up standard of living in terms of just the basics of lifespan and, and infant mortality to a pretty acceptable level everywhere without having to tear our societies apart to get there and without killing the alchemical furnace in the process. Because if we kill the alchemical furnace, we are well and truly screwed. But that doesn't mean that we need to have kids dying of diphtheria in rural Africa. It's not an either-or choice. But you have to stop measuring in terms of money and you have to start measuring in terms of lifespan. So when we talk about the digital revolution, mm -hmm. who is going to be the winner? Is it corporation? Is it people? Is it just the one winner? Can we well, actually all win? I'm, I'm seriously hoping that the winner in the digital revolution will be me. Um, <laughs> you know, Having decided that I'm going to go out there into the marketplace and try and make some money so I can privately finance the Hexier project and the disaster relief stuff and all the rest of that. Uh, so, but what be this individual benefits kind of scaling up to the level of society? Well, okay, so society as a whole is a terrible mess, right? It's always been a terrible mess. It's getting a little less terrible as time passes. But fixing society is the work for you know multiple generations. Each generation chips away at the problem a little more. But it's a very, very, very slow process. 
uh, in the 20th century, we saw a quarter of a billion people killed in projects which had unrealistic expectations for rapid social change. Yeah. Right? So I'm very, very wary of unrealistic expectations of social change. I think that we should generally expect society will continue to muddle along. In economically bad periods, society will get worse. In economically good periods, society will, generally speaking, get better. Over time, we gradually extend more and more rights and more and more and more significance to individuals over time. But unrealistic expectations of social change are incredibly dangerous. So what I want to see is toilets for the entire human race, light for the entire human race, clean water for the entire human race, hand washing for the entire human race, micronutrient supplementation for anybody that isn't getting enough food. Right? There are a bunch of things that we can do, five or ten dollars per person per year, that will sort out the vast majority of the totally unnecessary suffering in the world. This is social change that I absolutely believe in because it's economically possible, it doesn't produce massive expectations of unrealistic social change, and it alleviates an enormous amount of suffering. All of that stuff is doable, and it's largely uh, within reach within my generation or the generation after mine. On the other hand, um, we've got no position inside of our philosophies or inside of our um, culture which allows us to deal with the fact that there are people out there with an IQ of, you know, 180 who only need three hours a night of sleep and could speak five languages by the age of 10, right? We're also in a position where there are some people that are incredibly charismatic. They can stand up in front of a crowd and the crowd will pay $30 a ticket to see them sing badly, right? We have people that are completely extraordinary in fundamental ways and in ways which are nothing to do with anything that you would think of as being a meritocracy. Yes. And equality, you know, really, do we want to make everybody the same? Do we even want to try? Or do we try and want to let our societies make the best use possible of the exceptional talents that exist, while also accepting that nearly everybody is basically average? Right? Yeah. I would like to see a world, if you gave me a utopian magic wand, I'd like to see a world in which we accepted that the people that lose should have good quality of life and the people that win should be able to change the future. And I think that we can make that work without having to enslave the winners to support the losers. Right? Because in any given year, maybe one person in a thousand wins in a big way. It's an unusual thing. It's basically a lottery. Most of the research that I've seen done on what makes big winners says that chance is the dominant factor. But nonetheless, society produces them in the arts, in the sciences, in the economy, in politics, in all other domains, sports. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. And as you said, um, while we're discussing blockchain AI and some people mm -hmm. just need uh, water or lights. Yeah. And uh, maybe the win and the um, concept of winning mm -hmm. is different in different regions of the world. And also the goals that we are aiming to are different as well. So we shouldn't aim at one goal. Well, I mean, I think we can achieve a global minimum standard of living in which every human being has adequate food, water, hand washing, light, telecommunications, you know, immunization, birth control. There's a list of things. Yes. It's a few dozen dollars. Yep. Right? That is completely achievable for the entire human race within my generation or the one after. Right? 30 years from now, I think that will probably be done. Some of it will be done by market, some of it will be done by state, some of it will be done by charity, some of it will be done by open source local engineering. But that is completely achievable. And there is no reason for not doing it because it doesn't break anything important to try and success is very probable. What I'm wary of in the equality debate is the idea that we want to try and equalize income because that killed a quarter of a billion people in the 20th century. Every place that tried equalizing income wound up with genocide, pretty much. Uh, Swedish model works in Sweden, but probably only because the Americans are carrying their national defense budget. If you try and make Sweden run with military spending at a realistic level, given that they border Russia, things change. So what I'm basically suggesting is this. We accept that there is a power law distribution of winners. Yep. And we engineer such that the 80 or 90% of people that live very ordinary lives don't suffer unnecessarily. And yes. the ordinary life thing, I mean, you know, until I was 30, I was a backpacking nomad who wrote software when he needed money. Then I spent a long time in academia, uh, academia in the think tank world, never really made any money, you know, did incredibly interesting things. But for the vast majority of that period, I looked like somebody that was largely speaking losing because the startups that I were involved, was involved with never became big winners. 
right? I was the co-inventor of the world's fastest volume rendering algorithm in about 93. And the company that eventually formed around that was very successful. But by the time that company formed and they got organized to do something, I was long gone. Right? So, you know, I can personally empathize with the idea that you want to ensure quality of life for the people that are losing, but that's far more about stability, security, and access to healthcare than it is about access to absolute spending power. Uh, what does it mean for you to win? What winning well, means? So, in, in my case, uh, there are basically two things. The first is that 15 years ago, I got, uh, not quite 15 years, 14 years ago, I got very interested in the problem of climate refugees. And um, I have a set of plans sitting on paper for how you would approach managing the displacement of a quarter billion people. Right? And I think that I might be the only person in the world that has a realistic chance of building the engineering capacity to have those people be displaced, to catch them as they are displaced, and to resettle them without, them, uh, without too many of them dying in the process. And I've tried to get that work funded by all kinds of entities over the years, and nobody will touch it with a barge pole because it is so very radical and because the scenario is so very dark. So I want to make enough money doing the VC stuff that I'm doing and the blockchain and the engineering and all the rest of these bits and pieces uh, such that I can privately finance that research, that I can prototype, that I can desk, that I can build demonstrators. After that, it's up to global civic society to pull it together. In West, I am so incredibly wealthy that I can set up my own Gates Foundation. And to openly talk about the idea that money is a tool for changing the world and to talk about the stuff that I want to change is kind of a new thing for me. But basically, I decided that I was going to do capitalism because I want to privately finance climate migrant research. First part. Second part is, uh, it would be kind of nice if we didn't drive ourselves into extinction in my generation. And I think that there are a bunch of things that we could be pushing on much harder to get that done. But 15 years of slogging away you know, in the think tank world, defense, security, resilience, all the rest of that stuff has burned me out on that effort. So I'm taking care of myself, I'm taking a bit of a break. Yes. Once everything is kind of running again and, you know, the, the wheels are turning in the way that I want them to turn, then I will return to doing a little more work on the extinction risk stuff. Again, this becomes something where once you're willing to use capitalism to, as a tool, privately financing that stuff might also make a bunch of sense. Yeah. Um, but, you know, those are... You know, it's a very direct pairing, right? Absolutely. There are financial goals to achieve technical and policy goals that I tried to get done through government, and I tried to get done through academia, and I just couldn't find the radicalism to get that work done. So this puts me in a position of having to self-finance that stuff, and the way that you do that in this culture is you go into the marketplace with a big stick, you come out with a sack of gold, and then you go off and save the world. What are you saying about social identity, how it will be shaped by new technologies, as well as the individual identity? Mm -hmm. And also talking about the concept of private versus public, mm -hmm. not in terms of the blockchain, but in terms of the privacy, mm -hmm. identity, to what extent technologies like blockchain AI would make us more public or private? Mm. Um, so I don't like the category of prime. I like the category of secret. Right. So if we divide the world into public and secret, I think we get a much better idea of what the real terrain is than public and private. Because private is kind of like a few people know and maybe a bunch of other people get told and things leak. And, you know, actually, in a very real sense, there's not much privacy. Yes. Right? We talk about medical privacy. What we really mean is medical secrecy. You know, your doctor knows, nobody else knows. End of discussion. So private is a very squishy category. And we talk about private, but really the privacy that counts is actually secrecy. Financial secrecy, medical secrecy, uh, you know, legal secrecy. This stuff is super important. Um, I think that we are going to discover that mass access to real deep secrecy of the kind where even the state can't read it is incompatible with human survival because of biotech risk. Um, if people have access to that kind of secrecy, particularly in financial transactions, you know, there's this running joke on the internet that the IQ required to completely destroy the world drops by one point every year. And there's some truth to this. Nanotech, biotech, maybe even some kinds of software are so incredibly dangerous that small groups of people with relatively small amounts of money could potentially change the world in ways that would be incredibly damaging for everybody. So I think it's inevitable that as we go further and further and further into this kind of ultra technology age, we wind up with less and less and less secrecy uh, and less access to secrecy for ordinary individuals. What now, about personal secrecy? 
Well, I was going to say with a but. And the but is, if you don't know anything dangerous, you can't do anything dangerous with your secrecy. So actually, really only the technocratic elite need to live in a world where they're, monitor, they're carefully monitored. Right? If you have a you know, liberal arts degree and run a pottery studio, there's basically nothing that you can do with your time which is a substantial threat to anybody else. Whereas if you have a PhD in molecular biology and you've got access to a big lab at a university, maybe we have a right to monitor you around the clock. Right? So I think that we need to start dividing the world into areas which are genuinely dangerous and areas which are basically safe. And we need to accept that the genuinely dangerous areas are heavily, heavily monitored and the basically safe areas I think we should ignore. So what about social exposure uh, on social platforms and something that we have on our mobile phones? Mm. It's something different from the uh, secrecy in, in your understanding, or is it the same concept? Um, I think it's. I think that thinking about it as secret rather than private helps us draw the lines. So, for example, um, when I'm talking about cryptography, people say, Vinay, why do people need cryptography? And I say, well, you know, imagine that you're gay in Iran, right? If you're going to continue to be gay in Iran, you're basically going to have to have secrecy. And if you're going to be gay in Iran and you're going to use electronic platforms to meet people, you're going to require those platforms to reinforce secrecy against the state or you're going to wind up dead. Yeah. Right? Um, now, we can say, well, there should be political change. We should say, well, maybe people should change their behavior. Yes. We should say maybe people should leave. You can make all kinds of speculations about how it ought to be. But the simple truth is that the world is filled with long-term, stable, imperfect situations. And being gay in Iran is one of them. People have to live their lives. So, you know, you can make a clear case for personal secrecy as being incredibly important very, very easily. And different cultures have different things. Imagine being a pot smoker because you've got multiple sclerosis in America in the 1980s. Right? It's the height of the war on drugs. It relieves your symptoms. It may even modify the course of your disease. If you get caught, you're going to jail for 20 years. Right? This kind of craziness is pervasive in human culture. And we have to decide whether we're going to take the risk that personal secrecy in the face of irrational law is a human right and some people will abuse it. Or we say a rule of law is absolute and the world is too dangerous because of nanotech and biotech risk to allow people personal secrecy. I don't know which way we go on that. Yes. But my nightmare scenario is a bunch of crazy people that decide that they're going to do something radical to the human race using a virus. You sit at home, you build the virus, you let it out, and it kills all of the men with a testosterone level over 0.9. Or it kills all of the really stupid people. Or it kills all of the Chinese. Right? And you know this notion that you could start working on things like genetically specific bioweapons, I think that is almost certainly possible in the lab today, and if it's not, it will be very soon in the black world. But I think that molecular biology is getting to the point where you can see that stuff as being a real part of life within 20 years. And 20 years is the beginning of the internet to the present. 20 years in the future is not that long. Uh, and I really worry that we are going to wind up with a segregated society you know, large numbers of people with no access to those technologies who live in peace, freedom, and security, small numbers of people who do have access to those, those technologies that basically live in a police state. So what will happen to our identity? Will we have more external points or we will still be liable and responsible for um, maintaining and creating our identities? Um, I think that identity has clearly shattered for the young. Like people under maybe 25, 20, um, have grown up in an environment where they were always in a performative electronic fishbowl and what we think of as identity in a non-performative way is gone for those people. They're always connected to the crowd, they're always on stage and this notion that identity is who you are when you're at home alone with a book is gone because they're never at home alone with a book, they're at home alone with a book and also their word. In a way identity is becoming more social concept rather than individual. And it might be that the individual concept of identity was an anomaly of Western culture because actually human beings for the last many millions of years operated in tribal bands. Yeah. And the tribal bands, you know, if you were alone in the wilderness, you would die pretty quickly. So you always stuck around your people if you could, seems to be the general way that it works. But in some countries like Japan, that's already is the case, so collective mm -hmm. identity. Mm -hmm. But don't you think that in most of the Western societies, Individual identity was a driver of economic change and personal benefit? I mean, the West, as far as I can tell, was the culture that specialized in individual identity. 
and it's turned out to be enormously powerful. Uh, but at the same time, the West is very unstable and very violent. Yes. So I wonder whether the Western tendency towards murder, which is very strong in Western culture, I mean, Europe was a battlefield for a thousand continuous years. You know, think of the wars over religion. Yes. Just unbelievable horror because of the printing press. <laughs> you know, so I wonder whether the Western tendency towards individuality is also very, very uh, destabilizing and makes people prone to murder. And because it's, I mean, you know, long term, um, let me say a word about colonialism. So basically, you know, Europe gets hold of firearms first and then uses them to colonize the entire world. America then breaks from Europe and then heads off in its own direction, even more obsessed and oriented around the firearm. Yes. But actually, it's not really clear what European culture contributed to the world other than science and the firearm. And I think that fundamentally, if we have to pick which one of these things is more important, it ought to be science, <laughs> even though in practice it's the firearm. So I think that we really need to double down on science. Right? Yeah. We need to figure out how to depoliticize it. We need to figure out how to stop the market from corrupting it. And we need to get used to the idea that high quality scientific truth is the best truth that we've got access to. And I stress the high quality because junk science is the worst possible thing that we can do. I mean, junk science, every time I see people doing, you know, uh, pushing weak results as if they were fundamentally true in the same way they say, I don't know, quantum mechanics is true, um, you know, I, I just cringe because what I see is the lifeblood of the future bleeding out. So, you know, this notion that we should be emphasizing the other part of what Europe and America brought to the world, yes. right? De emphasize <clears throat> the violence, double down on the science, keep the science clean, work hard on high quality scientific truth rather than crap publication mills. That to me is a cultural um, position that gives us real hope. But in order to do that, you will um, have to change many values which are behind uh, Western society, which are quite strong. Mm -hmm. But this to me is a fight worth winning. Right? Because I think that scientific truth is the fundamental fruit of Western civilization. Right? And it's probably the most important innovation in human culture since the invention of agriculture. You know, people say it's the Industrial Revolution, but yes. no science, no Industrial Revolution. You can't build a steam engine without calculus. Right? So that notion that there is a, a kind of critical point where we discover a new way of knowing the world, yes. and that we're in danger of losing that because of politicization, because of outright bribery, and because of stupid diploma mills and all the rest of this stuff, that to me is a huge threat. And I think that, you know, I don't like to talk about things like reparations and debt, but if the price that the Western world extracted in the colonial period is ever going to be paid off, it ought to be by maintaining science in a really useful form and then using science to fix the rest of the world's problems, right? And very few Westerners identify with science as being a fundamental creation of their culture that has to be defended above all else, but I think it is. Because if we lose scientific truth because the market eats it, yes. or we lose scientific truth because politics eats it, you know, the climate scientists who are backing up 200 terabytes yes. of climate data right now in case Trump orders them to erase it, hmm. imagine the horror. You know, in that environment, there is something worth fighting for. And the idea that that was something where Western culture really was a spearhead in a direction which is objectively right and objectively good, to me, is the natural answer to the whole colonial trip. Like, we acknowledge colonialism, it happened, but we did science, and we're going to get it right, we're going to keep getting it right, to me, feels like a balance point in a way that, for example, reparations don't. Yes. And the weak identification between Europeans and Americans and the scientific method as the fundamental fruit of their culture probably is the single um, scariest thing that is happening right now. Right? I want to see Westerners rallying around science if they need a cultural loyalty to something that they've done to say, actually, we are not just a plague upon the species, but actually we've done something that's important. That is the something. Um, and I wonder how you change culture in such a way that people are proud of having invented science and will defend it along with the rest of their identity. Do you believe in technologically induced change? For example, blockchain technology, AI, can be one of the drivers of this change that would mm. have effects on society oh, yeah. as a whole. I mean, I, I think, for example, that the blockchain could potentially fix scientific publishing. And if we can fix scientific publishing and peer review, we could keep the politics out of science, we could keep the money out of science, and we could actually get real research done. You know, I mean, even if it was things like crowdfunding scientific research, I think there's an enormous amount of stuff, particularly in physics, which could get funded by crowds. 
there's all kinds of things that people won't be able to do and they can't because universities are not funding at a high enough level. Yes. You know, there's a real possibility of building your kind of Star Trek utopia on those kind of crowdfunded efforts around scientific research. And you know, I just I just don't see enough cultural defense of science. And the struggles around identity and colonialism and the kind of, you know, left wing intersectional feminism that kind of attacks white identity as being like, well what did white people ever do for the world? You're just a bunch of colonial maggots. Right? I think that the absolute counterpoint to that is, excuse me, here is science. This is how we got out of poverty. It's the best chance we have of survival as a planet. We really ought to be doubling down on that success. You know, in the upcoming culture wars, which seem likely to become increasingly vicious, I don't see anybody fighting for science as, no, there's a fundamental change that happened here. And if we stand on that fundamental point, we will not slip into error. And blockchains can help them. Yeah. Thank you very much for this very interesting um, conversation, interview. And we touched upon questions such as blockchain, artificial intelligence, as well as the cultural change mm -hmm. and modernity. Even though we might not have answers right now, but we'll keep looking for them. And we'll definitely we'll see many interesting things coming up. So, <laughs> okay.